Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just one minute. Um, we've got, but by all means, if you've got some questions around uh, microservices for APIs and events, please start um, posting your questions so we can get to that in a second. We've got Gibson and Claudio here, and Philippe's going to be joining as well. Yes, Mark, he's just getting some technical issues to connect, <laughs> as we all know. There's always, there's always a few of those at the conference. Okay, let's get started in any case, and Philippe can join us for the discussion as we go. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Mark Boyd. I use the pronouns he and him, uh, and I work with Platformable, uh, where we talk about um, uh, open ecosystems. And one of the issues that we're seeing a lot lately in government circles and the government adoption of APIs is event-driven architecture. So I'm really interested to be here with the Sincidia crew. We've got Gibson and Claudio, and Philippe's going to join us so soon. To get started, Gibson, do you want to introduce us uh, and tell us a little bit about your role at uh, Sincedia? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks all for joining the session today. So my name is Gibson Nascimento. I am the head of solutions at Sincedia. I look for uh, after the EMEA region. Uh, basically, my role is to make sure that solutions that we design and we propose to our customers, they are bringing all of this innovation. They are, you know, bringing the, the best of breed uh, solutions to make sure that customers are indeed uh, getting the best out of their APIs, microservices, and event-driven strategies. Dick and Claudio, let's hear from you. What's your role at Sincedia? Oops, Claudio, you're, we can't hear you. See, there's always a technical issue. <laughs> Oops. Well, let's, Cla Claudia is going to um, head off and then re-enter the room again. Well, uh, Claudia is joining. Claudio, is your, how's that? No, we still can't hear your microphone. Um, in the meantime, let's start sure. though, Gypsy, on asking about, so how much are you seeing, first of all, I guess, this session is about that sort of event-driven architecture and the use of microservices. What's How often are you seeing this come up or is this a growing need? Everyone's needing that real-time use of APIs and then broken it down to a granular level? Yeah, yes, yes, it is. So this is becoming more and more common. So most of the companies there, you know, seeing that APIs, you know, APIs, they are very good asset. But as you know, they bring a lot of pressure to, to the backends because it's it's real time or near real time, right? So you have request response. When we talk about even driven architecture, we are talking about the change shift in this approach. So you actually inform someone that there's something ready for them to then come to you. So you know, companies are moving away from this traditional way of connect to a more sophisticated way that or underloads the pressure, especially when it comes to their backend existing legacy applications. APIs are too large a sort of um, component, modular component in that sort of architecture. So you break it down into microservices. Is that right? Yeah. So the APIs are actually the front face service that you know you tell your customers how to connect with you. And then when it comes to microservices, we are talking about the, and there, this is actually a very good discussion, very good question. And I, I do hope that Claudio managed to sort out his audio there because we've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, so the microservices, oh, and we have Felipe as well. Good. Sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> microservices, it's how you actually break down your business. So it's not just about the technical, let's say, way of splitting services. So I have 
uh, get something, uh, post something, but it's actually how you you split your business into different domains, and then you create services for that specific domain. And I would actually really like to hear the other guys as well here because they do have a lot to tell about this. Maybe Felipe. Sure. Uh, well, sorry about the delay, guys. And well, like Gibson is telling us, uh, well, microservice, it's about shifting almost everything in the company. So the word itself, the word micro is not that accurate, right? So it's a pretty tricky thing to handle inside companies. So it's the almost the first questions that you have, uh, we have in our customers, for example. So we tend to identify this word and we, we tending to identify this specifically use cases about this word, handling different aspects, especially focus on the business itself. So uh, we are applying today many different techniques depending on the use case, of course, but we are applying many techniques like uh, DDD, uh, domain driven design to identify the business itself and then break down to the technology perspective, of course, because microservice is not just technology. It's not a buzzword in the market, for example. Uh, we actually need to specify the business, not quotes here in the right way. And of course, uh, to bring the context uh, using the business and then spread it to the technology. And the, the world will be pretty straightforward because we are breaking the domains in a proper way. So the scalability, the horizontal scalability will be natural in this way. So this is how you're working today. Uh, Claudio, if you want to add something. Yeah, uh, can you hear me right now? It's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That Maybe if I turn on the microphone, it's working as well. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as Gibson and Philip said, I think uh, microservice is not about mi how micro it is. I think it's how to, for me, I, I think it's not about technical stuff, but it's about how to scale things, you know, how to split, split the things and make it softer, uh, to make software, I think, uh, for sure. It calls some, um, maybe you can use some techniques like DDD, as Philip said, these, these things, but I think it's how to scale to, to, to develop something, you know? Yeah. So then coming back to your first, to your point, Mark, it's not just about the level of granularity of the APIs, but it's more about the business. It's about it's scaling the teams. You know, it's, it's much more than that. Yeah. Sure. Come back to that idea of like how smaller, uh microservice needs to be or how you would get started? Like, do you work on one area of the business or one event driven use case first? But first of all, like Ramesh um, has asked, he's got a very specific question. Um, what is the best way to notify end the, the end of long running tasks? So I guess, is that part of event driven architecture? He's talking about running the job as async and then, but would you poll Kafka, would you pull webhooks? You've got some ideas around how you've, about the event driven architecture design patterns that you might use. What, is there any specific pattern that this immediately brings to, uh, Ramesh's question brings to mind or what's the event driven architecture patterns that you tend to use? Philippe, you wanna take that one? Uh, sure, well, uh, about ETL itself, so like, we have a bunch of different use cases that will depend on the business again, the business again, but uh, well, uh, we can run ETL heavy process in batching process. This is no problem, but uh, right now we are tending to bring the sense of almost online business. So we are tending to build data pipelines for almost everything. I mean, uh, some use cases will require some ETL and heavy batching process. But uh, today on the newest architecture that we are working, we are tending to bring the sense of the most real time, right? So we want to use this data in a, in a real time fashion. So we are shifting from heavy ETL process to uh, heavy data pipelines. I mean, 
to bring more online data for the teams to work with, to work with real data and online data, of course, because in the business itself, the, the difference between one day, for example, can be a huge impact on your business. For example, you have a, a peak sale, for example, you, you want to know yeah. when things are happening, not exactly to wait until something finished. So we are kind of shifting things, especially using event-driven architectures. So to spread out multiple events throughout on a platform, for example, is allowing us to uh, work with less batching process and ETL processing and more with online processing and see what the, how things going on at the moment, which is the, the, what really matters for us today. Yeah, but, but I guess if I can add on this, uh, I think that, you know, Philippe mentioned something very interesting, which is this shift uh, from heavy ETL process to data pipelining. But I guess that, you know, some, some companies can't just get rid of their ETL processes, right? And I, I, I think that Kafka is a good way to solve this as well. You know, because then basically you create a process where you, whenever something is done, your detail process is done, you just post something on a, a Kafka topic, for example, and then there's someone listening to that. So it, it is a way to implement this. It is. It is. Well, great. Um, Ramesh, I'll be glad to hear the definite answer there. The with Shiva, meanwhile, was asked, wouldn't have mo having multiple microservices increase the number of hops and also add multiple failure points. This is a question that comes up a lot in our microservices architecture. The, and it ties into the idea of then how big is a microservice or how micro is a microservice. So what, how, where's the balance with that? Is that, a, is that an issue, the increase in the, uh, multiple failure points? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> And why I would say yes, it, it all depends on how you develop your microservices, right? Uh, today, we, we've been talking a lot about service mesh to manage all of these service to service integrations and guarantee that traffic, it's running smoothly. And whenever you have any failure in point, you can easily identify what is the actual instance of the service that it's failing or that it's taking too long to process. So, you know, Again, coming back to the to the first point, it all depends on how you uh, design and develop your services. If you're just creating services for the sake of creating them, as many services as you want, just because you want to be micro, then for sure it may add a lot of complexity. But then, uh, and then I will just perhaps give a glimpse here, and then Claudio perhaps can can uh, give more details. It's also how you connect service to service. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about East, West and North and South communication. So if you create uh, an architecture pattern where all your services are connecting to other services through, for example, an API gateway all the time, then for sure you add a lot of complexity there. But if you're making their, this communication service to service using, for instance, gRPC, which is, you know, uh, very, efficient, let's say, way to connect service to service, this level of complex or this, let's say, number of hops, it's actually not really relevant because the connection, it's very efficient. I think, Gibson, as well, the evolution of the platforms, I mean, deployment of platforms helps a lot at this point. For instance, Kubernetes, for instance, help us to, to have uh, self-healing behaviors in our applications, you know, I think that's the, 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 the important point. Maybe you can use the, your own infrastructure to help you on this point, I think. Uh, choose, for instance, Kubernetes or maybe Search Mesh, as Gibson said, it helps a lot. Maybe it's, it's, a, it's a good point, I think. Take a look on so, the platforms. So that idea of infrastructure as code, it, uh, microservices helps bring you uh, to that sort of idea as well. One of the themes all of you have been mentioning though, is in order to make that decision, you need developers and uh, architects, system architects need more discussion with the business side to be able to define what those business functionalities are. And it's only when you do that, that you can really break it down and identify at what level of microservices you need to get. Would that be right? Yeah, that's right. 
That's right. So if we think back in the days where we would be we would be building the crudes, you know, create, delete. So you wouldn't really think about business functionalities, but more about the standard uh, operations. And nowadays, those standard operations are still there. But now you create them inside a business context. Yep. Cool. Um, OK, we've got one minute left. Let's just go to, let's ask anything else in the audience. We'll see if there's time for one more question in the audience. Um, other than that, um, so how, uh, maybe we'll finish with, um, because events is so huge right now, how can microservices be leveraged to expose events? Yeah. It's a big one to finish on. Yeah, it is. It is <laughs> like, a big one. <laughs> but we've sort of talked about like, okay, you've um, working with business, you've identified, you've broken down those um, microservices. Um, we understand that, you know, data, stale data gets old really fast and you can't use it for your, um, for, for unlocking value and identifying opportunities in, um, in a whole range of different ways. So now if you get into um, uh, the, uh, but, so now when you're working with uh, microservices to enable um, uh, events, what is the, what's that next step that needs to be done? Or, you know, where do you tend to go with, uh, with your clients then at, the, at that next stage? Okay, uh, Mark, I think the, I, I love how the event-driven architecture works. I think it makes the, the makes the development task, task easy, I think. I love how to create events, you know, uh, events mean something for, uh, for the business. I, I love this, this kind of thing. I, and I love event-driven architecture as well to, to, help, to help you as a, a synchronous scenarios as well. It's very good for asynchronous scenarios and very good for improve your computational resources, I think. How to use it, uh, your computational resource better, I think. It's very good for, for this case. Uh, I, I love uh, event-driven architecture and I think it's very easy to, to work in. And I love to discuss about events, events for it. Uh, create some curate order events. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's very nice uh, to, to participate on this, these discussions, I think. Well, uh, about event driven and most related for our previous questions, right? So uh, if we can leverage a solid event driven, for example, we can use data for everything. I mean, uh, we can establish a solid uh, perspective of the events and the data flowing actually and spread out our business throughout multiple stakeholders and then use this data wherever we want. And like computational resources, so it's pretty expensive, right? Uh, so everything is uh, everybody's trying to shrink the infrastructure and well even driven allowing us to see and scale up and down accordingly from the flow of course and well nowadays data is everything so uh, if we are able to actually bring a solid event driven one like i said we, we can use ddd with event driven architecture all together and then leverage uh, data architecture to see everything flowing and of course use the events accordingly to the business in an online fashion, for example. My apologies. We've actually got um, until uh, 35 past, so we've still got a good <laughs> another eight minutes. So we've got plenty of time for a few more questions. My apologies for getting the agenda wrong. Um, so please post a, uh, post a few more questions. We did have some people who were attending um, share uh, beforehand. Um, so do all ex all microservices expose APIs and are these APIs considered internal or external for North and South communication? You also talked about East and West communication. Do you want to quickly describe um, that first? For, there's some new newcomers in the audience who might appreciate that. And then, yeah, we'll get into that question. Sure, sure, absolutely. So then East and West and North and South communication. East and West is the service to service communication. So it's well microservice consuming services from other ones. Uh, and North and South, it's when you are exposing your services to the external world. That could be either, uh, and then we know those as the actual APIs. Uh, that those could be, uh, external external apis but i mean public apis like you have uber for example or you could have uh the netflix api for example 
which is again it's it's an api that goes completely externally it's it's you know out there uh but it's only used by netflix applications so you you can't just connect to netflix right so then th this is setting setting up the context and then coming back to to the question mark do all microservices have an api yes indeed they do that so if we're talking about east and west communication uh like i mentioned before so we could either have a restful api a microservice exposing a restful api or using grpc so yes it's just a different 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 style of api uh but then no for the same question because not all apis will be exposed externally so then you will have let's say uh, a business service if you think like uh, an order management uh, microservice this microservice will actually trigger loads of other microservices check if i have stock check if i have if there is gift wrap then i need to get something else try to check if the invoice system is working loads of things that will under, that will happen underneath and you don't even know but front face you have only one service exposing a, let's call a public api or a private api but it's an, an api to the external world so yes all services can have uh, an api they can expose an api but not all services will expose an external api so then that this leads into a good question from aaron in the audience any recommendations then for architecting microservices and external facing gateway api so they work well together mm. that's actually a good one <laughs> Sleepy, you want to take well, this yeah well, <laughs> well recommendations we, we do have a bunch but uh well the, the api gateway actually is a very handy pattern that we can use uh, by architecturing the microservices because, well, it's a way to bring up security and decouple uh, a little bit of the non-functional requirements from the code from the microservice itself, especially for the North and South perspective, because for example, you're going to expose your microservice, but you can expose the microservice to the gateway and then the gateway will expose the microservice to the external world, and that's it. And you can establish a secure way of communications, for example, IP filter or directly connections for VPNs, for example, yeah. from your microservice to the API gateway, and then use the API gateway capabilities to do everything else. I mean, the DOS attacks, filtering, IP filtering, OAuth, well, you name it as the non-functional requirements. And the services, the microservices itself are taking care about the business it's supposed to be, and your non-functional requirements are taking care about from Kubernetes perspective and then the API gateway perspective, of course. Yeah. So, and actually this is a pretty good link from the workshop that they're going to run later. So <laughs> I'm going to show one example to do it. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. So stay tuned for that one. That's, uh, that's coming up this afternoon. That's with you, Philip. Yeah. Claudio, do you have something else to add on this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have the API Gateway is a very good uh, place to to work with API strategies as well. I mean, sure. uh, manage your API lifecycle, manage your customers, manage this this kind of things. I think uh, it's it's a very good place to to put this this kind down there. Yeah, and if I can just wrap up this one, I think that how they work well together. Actually, they were, in my opinion, they were meant to work together. In fact. So being the API gateway, the one that just like Claudio and Felipe mentioned, will work with your strategy and bring all the non-functional requirements. So you are able to expose that microservice securely to the external world and you manage who is working with your service, you know, who is consuming, how they are consuming. And then you have this microservices doing the actual work, you know, so that's, yeah. they were meant to work together, in fact. Okay, fantastic. But you don't need to have all those microservices going through that external facing gateway API. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Only, okay, only when right. you want to expose something to the external world. Right. Um, and then is there with so GRPC, so then if you're, so that's like point to point integrations again. Are we back to that? <laughs> Oh my goodness. No. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> no, I think that, that's the main difference here, Mark, is that uh, we leverage a lot of reusability, right? So you don't rebuild microservice and then you make sure that any time that you need to uh, connect, you reuse a microservice. If you're exposing your microservice, you're then using the API gateway to do that. So you have an API doing this. So it's not really point to point. So you're creating this internal connections and external connections. But yes, it does look like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little bit cheeky there. But then, but it also means that so when you're working, then do you tend to work then with when you're working with a company and they've got individual business units and you're working with them to, ident to identify the microservices that are suited to to expose for functionality for their business, like you were saying check inventory, order items, you know, that sort of thing. Then mm -hmm. when you go to another business unit, are you bringing along that sort of library of microservices so that they're not duplicating similar functionalities? Absolutely, absolutely. Especially if they so, make, yes. There you go, yep. Yep. Claudio, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I think it is. Maybe you can create some internal patterns to handle this, this situation. I love, uh, for, for instance, Christian Charlton, uh, say something like the microservice ch chassis. It, it's very one, it's very good one, one place to, to start there, you know. Maybe you can share this chassis for the whole company. It's, it's, yeah. it's very nice. Yeah. Cool. So then you end up building up not just the microservices catalog for the business, but also like the um, it, it's a it's not quite architectural decision records, is it? But it's more like these are the more design like, patterns that we use. Yeah. It's more like a foundation, right? So you build a foundation right. for your microservices to run, to be reused, to be leveraged throughout the business. You know. So okay. and, uh, about the boundaries, of course. Uh, yeah. We do have boundaries between the services and the business specifically. So some part of the business needs specifically functionalities for the microservice. And this communication is pretty natural. Like we said, microservice, it's a company-wide stuff. So uh, we are spreading the information for different stakeholders. And we are acting like we do have internal customers. For example, if a different team needs to access, I specifically part of my service or specifically functionality, whatever, we're going to treat them as an internal customer. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're going to spread out the boundaries and to, for your domain work properly and your, especially the horizontal scalability works smoothly, of course. We do not have to, actually it's, it's not a good practice to uh, manipulate other teams or other domain service directly. So always do it by the interface, use the API to do it. So this is the main recommendation here about different aspects of the business consuming microservices between each other. So this is the, the way that we are doing this today. Please do that, please do that. <laughs> please use the interface, do not share the service. <laughs> please do that. Yeah. Not sure if you have any other question coming from the audience. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Mark, you're on mute. We can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Muted. Still mute. <laughs> I think he's trying to type something there. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, there's some delay between. No. <laughs> ah, microphone stopped. Okay. No, take your time. Yeah. Actually, uh, one, one topic to add about the microservice communication is that uh, we can do it even with event driven. So, both ways communicate between each other using the external event or using the external API and treat your different business areas as internal customers. So this is the way that you're communication, you're doing the communication. Uh, I think we're not no. able to hear you, you still more. Yeah. <laughs> not sure if you can unmute, Mark. Uh, oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> 
Thank you. We'll do that. And guys, thank you very much. I think we are actually past the hour here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for the opportunity for watching us. We are going to share emails here. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if you want to chat about the topic of today. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much, guys.